you can become financially successful in any field, whether you're a dancer, whether you're a doctor, whether you are an engineer, whether you are a teacher, you can become financially successful, but this is where it's more than just school education, it's financial education. What are some of the lies that we're taught when we're young growing up that help to keep us poor? Sure, let me start with this. When I was growing up, I was taught that if I wanted to become successful, it's a very simple path. I need to study hard in school, get good grades, and then go out and become a doctor. My parents are immigrants from a state in India called Punjab. My parents came to this country with very little, and so they worked their butts off. And so I saw them work hard, and I wanted to take care of my parents, and I naturally wanted to become successful too. And I said, okay, I'll follow that path. And everyone said that that's the right thing to do. My teachers said so, my friends said so, my parents' friends said so. Everybody says that that's the right path to become successful. That's the path that I was going down. So if I wanted to become successful, I just needed to check all the boxes, go out, get the, get the good grades, get the good degree, and then that will do it. And along the way, that's when I started to realize that maybe this isn't the only way, and maybe this isn't the right way. And it wasn't until I was in college that I really started to question the system and question the things that I've been taught. So my first realization of this was I was studying for the medical college admission test, the MCAT. And as I'm studying for this test, I'm, I get really bored and antsy in between my study sessions. And I start Googling richest people in America. Hmm. And as I start to do that, I start to see, okay, the Forbes list, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates. None of these people are actively working as doctors. None of them are actively working as an employee. They are doing something completely different. And so I was like, well, what's going on here? I thought that your grades were directly correlated to your income. Turns out that's not the case. And so that was my first realization of realizing the first point was, which was wealthy people don't work to climb the corporate ladder. They're working to own the corporate ladder. Wow. And I didn't even know that was possible. Mm. And you don't have to only do one or the other. You can do both because most people don't have the ability to just go out and buy a business. But what you need to understand is that wealthy people aren't working for a salary. They're working for something bigger than that. While the majority of people, most of us are told, go to school, get good grades, get a job, and then work to climb the corporate ladder, get a promotion, get a bigger salary, and that's how you become wealthy. But the wealthy people are doing something completely different because if you only rely on your salary, you're just one step away from being broke. You lose your job, or you get injured, you can't go to work, or the, your boss runs the company into the ground. Well, now you're screwed and you're the one paying the price. And so this is where the difference is wealthy people are not looking for just one stream of income. What they're looking to do is they want to own a piece of the company. They want to work for equity. And it goes to actually understanding the way our financial system works. And this is one of those things that I wish every single person was taught in middle school, in high school, in college, because we live in a capitalist society. Now, you can hate it. You can love it. It is what it is. And what that means is in a capitalist society, there are two ways that you make money. You can make money from your labor or you can make money from your capital. Wealthy people make money from their capital. When you make money from your labor, what you're doing is you're exchanging your hours for dollars. You're going to work, you're getting a paycheck. And at the end of the day, there's always going to be a limit to what you can do with that. Right. But what wealthy people are doing is something completely different. They're taking the money that they earn and they're putting the money to work. Mm. They're using their money to buy assets. They want to get equity. They want to own things, whether it's companies, whether it's real estate. They're, so as soon as they get paid, they're not going to go out and go to the Gucci store, go to the Louis Vuitton store. They want to take that cash, invest it into the assets, buy the equity. And then once they start building the wealth, that's when you can start spending your money on the Gucci, the Louis Vuitton, or whatever you want. So the first step is understanding that it's a different game. You have to understand the rules of the game because most people hate the game. They hate the system. But what I'm saying is learn the rules because I grew up one of those people. I didn't grow up learning about money. I thought money was a taboo topic. That's what I was always told. Don't worry about money. Don't talk about money. Yet every single person is going to work every single day for a paycheck. So it's like, why, why is everybody going to work for a paycheck if we're not willing to talk about money? So that's the first thing you have to understand is you got to learn the rules and wealthy people are working to climb the corporate ladder. Sorry, wealthy people are working to own the corporate ladder. 
not just climb the corporate ladder. I think it's so ironic. I mean, time is our most limited resource and we slave away, right? Blood, sweat, and tears for an organization that if you were to die within a week, you'd be replaced. Yeah. And this is where, you know, some companies are, newer companies are starting to change the way that they operate, which is good because you kind of started to see a divide in the way that our business side of the world works, where some companies have the old mindset where they're like, you have to come into the office if you want to get paid. You have to work these particular hours. You have to get permission to go to the bathroom. And other newer companies are saying, well, okay, you can have the flexibility to work from home. And you can also have a piece of the upside of the company. Hmm. So some companies nowadays are giving the option for employees to earn equity ownership in the company. So now you're working for the company to get a salary, but you're also working to grow the profits. And as you're working to grow the profits, you get a piece of that upside through the equity, through your ownership. Other companies, they'll give you revenue share. And so you're starting to see some of this, but there's still a big divide and you're 100% right. This is where you have to start valuing, valuing your own interests because at the end of the day, it is very profitable to keep people financially uneducated. It's very profitable to keep people poor. And this is where you have to understand how to look out for your own best interests. Because if you just trust your company, your corporation, well, then they have the ability to take advantage of you. You can't just trust the banks because, you know, that that is like the institution for money, right? Where people look for financial advice. How big of a home should I buy? How much can I, uh, big of a car can I buy? Well, banks are incentivized to lend you money hmm. because that's how they make money. And so it's in the bank's best interest to keep you financially uneducated, to keep you broke, because that's going to keep you indebted to the bank. It's going to keep you coming back, asking the bank, how do I take care of my money? And the bank's going to say, just give it to us. Oh, man. And then the bank's going to take care of it. I mean, it's the same with the school system. Uh, <laughs> so the way that our school system works now, I went through a lot of schooling. I went through high school, I went through college, I went through a year of graduate, graduate school, then I went through law school. And I went through a lot of schooling because I thought this was the way that you become successful. And I went through law school because when I told my parents that I'm not going to be a doctor, they weren't having it. And essentially, long story short, the conversation was if you want to keep pride in the family, you have to at least become an attorney. Oh my God. So it was a difficult process for me. But on the bright side, I said, well, I can go to law school part-time, which means I can work on me and my business full time. <laughs> so I, I was willing to make that compromise. And during that time, you know, that's, that's when I realized that the school system is very interesting where it, the cost of education has gone up so significantly. And when did it really start to go up? Well, if you go back a little while ago, the United States government released a program which guaranteed student loans to anybody who wanted it. So if the government's going to guarantee student loans to anybody who wants it, colleges are hearing this saying, oh, you mean we can charge whatever we want and we're going to get paid? And as soon as that happened, you saw tuition rates skyrocket. Now, this is where things get interesting. It's like asking the question, why? Start digging a little bit deeper, right? If you look into the United States balance sheet, what you'll see is that student loans are the number one asset on the United States balance sheet. It is the thing that's keeping so many young people, millennials broke. It's stopping millennials from buying a home. It's stopping millennials from being able to afford their dream wedding. It's stopping millennials from being able to invest their money. But at the same time, it's the same thing that's making the government richer. And so it's like, you have to, you can't just blindly trust anyone else. You have to be able to trust yourself. So are we canceling college or what? Well, look, I had a great time in college. I loved college. Uh, I learned a lot in college, but I didn't learn what I learned through the classroom. Mm. I became an entrepreneur in college, and it was a great opportunity for me because, so when I was in high school, um, I, I started this teen party company. I used to work at Indian weddings, and I got to know a lot of the DJs. And the DJs were like, hey, just pretty know a lot of kids in high school. How about we throw a teen party? And I was like... All right, whatever. You know, you, we're in high school. It's kind of like a cool look to be that guy. Um, it was a, I was a different person then. So I said, okay. So in high school, I started hosting these teen parties with my DJ friends. It was just a hobby. Uh, we were working with some of the local restaurants and hosting parties there. Now I go to college. 
I don't know what to expect because my parents didn't go to university here. And um, I assume everybody goes to college and they spend their Friday nights in the chemistry lab doing reactions. <laughs> and I go to college. And I remember this because I didn't know what I was supposed to take to college. I didn't know what to expect in college. I packed five things when I went to college. I took a sleeping bag. I took a microwave. I took like, I didn't even take towels. And I didn't have um, a blanket. I slept in a sleeping bag for the first, I don't remember how long. And I didn't have a towel. I would just like shake off the water like this. <laughs> wow. So I didn't know what to expect. And so I'm thinking Friday nights, people are going to be studying because you're in college. Like this is your time. People are taking out student loans to go to college. It's expensive. Like you, you got to make use of every minute that you're here. And people are just drinking, partying everywhere. I'm like, first off, none of you guys have any money unless I'm completely wrong here. And you're blowing all this money that you don't have on partying. So I was like, well, what do I do? Because I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm not really into the party business. It was just a hobby for me. But I'm like, maybe I can host the parties that people mm. go to. So that's what I did. Uh, I was a freshman, I was 17. And I started knocking on doors of every club, venue, bar, restaurant on campus. And I said, hey, can I host a party here? And some of the owners would say, yeah, it's gonna cost you 10 grand. I was like, 10 grand? I don't got 10 grand. And then I, you know, you keep going down the list. And then eventually someone said, yeah, you can do a party here. We're not gonna charge you a penny. Just give us half of your cover charge. So if 100 people come in, I charge each person $10. That's $1,000 of cover revenue. Uh, they take 500, I take 500. So now all of a sudden I'm in business. I don't wow. have to put any money out of my pocket. And that's what I did. Um, I come into college and do that. And so you know, that was my initial exposure to entrepreneurship. And it set me up to do a lot more. But you know, college is what you make it at the end of the day. We need doctors, we need attorneys, but the problem is we need doctors, attorneys, accountants, as people who actually want to do these things. Because I'll give you a completely personal story. You know, I was told to become a doctor because that's how you become successful. Hmm. Why? Because you go to school, you get good grades, and you can, you know, you, you go to those career fairs, and they, they'll show you the different job options you have. Doctor, lawyer, engineer, you know, the whole list. And then they also have the average income. And, and any list you look at, any of these career fairs, guess what? Doctor, lawyer, engineer, accountant are going to be your they're highest. The top. They're the top income jobs. So what's going to happen? Well, people are going to look at this. People who are you know, looking at, I, I, I want to take care of my family. I want to become successful. Whatever the reason is. For me, I wanted to give back to my parents because I saw how hard they bust their butt. I want to take care of them. I need more money in order to do that. It's the reality of life. And so I was like, well, I'll become a doctor. It makes sense. It's the top on the list. And so I was becoming a doctor for all the wrong reasons. And I, I think there's, there's people, now not everyone, but there are people who do that. And we need more good doctors. We need more good attorneys. We need good, more good accountants. We need people who do it because they love it, not because of just the paycheck. And obviously you want to be financially compensated for what you do, but this is where you know, the education system has to change. It, it, it is inevitable because one is extremely expensive to go to college. We're told that, hey, if you want to go out and get a good job, you want to go and become successful, you have to go and get a higher uh, education degree. But let's, let's look at the stats. Nowadays, nearly everybody has a college degree. 40 years ago, very few people had a college degree. So what does that mean? Having a college degree today does not make you stick out like it did 30, 40 years ago. If you have a college degree today, you're just like everybody else. Mm. It doesn't give you any sort of advantage like it did a long time ago. That's why a lot of companies have been starting to drop their college degree requirement. Now, of course, it's going to take it some more time before it's completely gone. But companies are looking for more than just a college degree now because it is becoming expensive. You have to go through a bunch of stupid or kind of crappy classes in order to graduate. Um, I know my brother... I had a big, big debate with my brother with this because he was taking these classes on the history of dance. And I asked him, I said, how many credits <laughs> is this history of dance class? He says, four credits. I said, four credits. Do you know how much that's costing you? I don't know. Oh, God, it's ridiculous. It's $1,000 a credit. You're paying four <laughs> grand to learn the history of dance. And I, look, I, my brother and, my, and I am really good friends. And I I'm mean, like, shout out, to, I mean, like, no shade to dance enthusiasts, no, it's, right? it's fine. But, look, I'm a dancer. I grew up dancing in college. Oh, you, that's awesome. I'm a dancer, yeah. I grew up doing, a, 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 I competed. What kind of dancing? Bangarda, it's, it's a Punjabi dance. Amazing. So I love dancing. But for, my brother wanted to go down, uh, you know, a completely different field, but he had to take that class in order to graduate. 
Mm. Okay. And he's being forced to take this along with a number of other classes, paying thousands of dollars. And my brother's not even going to the class. He goes in, he had this system where they had like this, they were called eye clickers. Okay. Him and his friends would have this system where one person would go to the class, hit the attendance, they would go home and play video games. I'm like, you're paying, you're paying $4,000 to do that. And it's just one of those things where the system has to change because it is, it just, people don't realize the cost of what they're doing. And you can become financially successful in any field, whether you're a dancer, whether you're a doctor, whether you are an engineer, whether you are a teacher, you can become financially successful. But this is where it's more than just school education, it's financial education. And this is the thing that we're never taught. I went through a lot of schooling. Never once was I taught about money. Never once was I taught about investing. Never once was I taught about passive income. Never once was I taught about building any sort of wealth. These are things that I had to learn on myself, by my own. And now if you are trying to figure it out, what happens? Well, you go to school, you're trying to check all the boxes, you graduate, now you have a, a mountain of student loan debt, and then you go and get a job, and then you're told to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And now you have no idea what to do. Your corporation, if you go work for a big company, is going to give you this packet saying, here's your 401k options. And you think, oh, okay, I'll open up a 401k because that's what everybody else does. Now, here's the thing. The 401k was never intended to be your sole investment plan. It was never intended to be the sole retirement plan. Even the founder of the 401k has come out and said that the 401k has gone awry. Wow. Why? Because people are investing their money into the 401k thinking that this is going to take care of me. And it, the, you have to do so much more. And the reality is, if you took look at American working adults in a pie, just about half of Americans have zero investments at all. So no 401k, zero. no IRA, no stock market investments, no real estate investments, none. Out of the now 50% of Americans that have an investment, just over half of them have no investments outside of their 401k and IRA. Wow. And so now- So, uh, gonna, so fewer than a quarter of Americans- Exactly. Have investments outside of their exactly. retirement. And I'm going to take this one step further. Now we're going to look at some more economic level now. Because traditionally- Retirement was a, you could think of it like a three-legged stool. You had your social security, you had your pension, and then you had your own personal self-retirement investment options. Well, pensions have become a thing of the past. I mean, they just, they don't exist anymore. Companies don't offer pensions. They realize it was too expensive for them. And a lot of people now who are trying to retire are struggling because some of the companies are either cutting their pensions or getting rid of their pensions. So that leg of the stool is gone. Second, you have social security. And social security is turning into a huge mess because what's happening is social security, like people who are young now, if you're paying social security today, you're not paying into social security for your retirement, you're paying social security for somebody else to retire. Hmm. So what does that mean? Social security is spending more money that they bring in. So they, if nothing changes with social security, it will completely run dry in the next 15 years. But we can't let that happen. At least that's what the government says, right? So what do you do? Well, you know, you can raise taxes, you can do these things. But at the end of the day, they're going to try to find a way to continue funding Social Security. And if you can't raise it through taxes, then you're going to do some sort of money printing in order to fund Social Security. This is what we've done for decades now, because anytime the government spends more money that they bring in, they will print the money. That's why we have this national debt crisis, we have $30 trillion worth of national debt. So if the government spends more money than they bring in, how do they do that? They go to an entity called the Federal Reserve Bank, and they say, hey, we need money to do something. The Fed prints that money, gives it to the government, and then the government can then spend that money. We saw this in like magnificent proportion during the 2020 pandemic because we've printed um, loans to businesses, we've bailed out the stock market, we sent out stimulus checks, even though the government wasn't making any money. So that's how it works. But what happens anytime we print more money? Inflation happens. Inflation means, comes from the word inflate. What are you inflating when you have inflation? The monetary supply, the money supply. So when you print more money to, say, fund more social security checks, you can send a bigger size check but then more inflation happens. Inflation now means that the value of your dollar goes down, causing the price of things to go up. So you can never 
adjust or beat inflation through money printing because you can print as much money as you want, send it through these stimulus checks, send it through social security, but then what's gonna happen? You get a bigger social security check, but it's still not buying you as much as it should or hmm. would have because now the cost of living is so much higher. This is the inflation problem that we're facing right now because in 2020 and 2021, the government and the Fed printed trillions and trillions of dollars. Well, this money was printed and injected into the economy. It was through the form of bailouts for businesses, it bailed out the stock market, and uh, in the form tried to bail out people through stimulus checks. Now, it was great at the time because now everybody felt rich. You were getting unemployment checks, you were getting stimulus checks, businesses were getting unlimited amounts of money, and the economy suddenly started booming. You saw, I mean, if you look at the, the markets in 2020, we saw the fastest and most drastic stock market crash ever. It exceeded the rate of the Great Depression. But then, immediately after that started, we saw the fastest stock market rally in the history of time. How? Especially in tech. <laughs> Especially in tech. But across the entire stock market, the Fed opened up the money printer, where they injected the markets with free money, and then everything started going up. And then everyone said, well, this is great. I have money to spend. And you know, some people took this cash and they paid down their debts. Some people saved this money. Some people invested this money. But then you had some people that took this cash and said, I got some free money. I'm going to go to the Gucci store. <laughs> I'll go to the Louis Vuitton store. And we were, this is one of the craziest things. In 2021, we were in a recession. Yet this, the sales of luxury items, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, they were breaking records. Wow. Just think about that. We're in a recession, yet luxury items are breaking record sales. Why? Well, people were still getting stimulus checks and they were willing to stand in line two hours to buy a Gucci bag. And now we're starting to feel the effects of inflation because when you're in a time where we're not producing any products, the only thing we're producing as an economy is money without the production of any items, this money then gets injected into the economy. Now people can go out and buy whatever they want, but nothing's being produced. So if you have demand but no supply, well, people are buying, nothing's being produced, it's gonna create supply chain issues mm -hmm. because nothing can be produced. We are in the middle of a pandemic and all these issues are going on. And so there's that's when the supply chain issue started. And then it just continued to get worse and worse and worse. And the Fed kept saying, oh, it was transitory. Don't worry about it. It's going to get better. Now, here we are. And now we're starting to see the real effects of this. Supply chain issues are a byproduct of inflation. Inflation is not caused by the supply chain. And, and so that's the issue that we're facing right now. Because as soon as you, know, you try to fix the problem by just printing money, it cr causes more problems. The most expensive kind of money that there is is free money. Wow. And this is, you know, and, and it's unfortunate, but this is the issue that we're facing. And the person who pays the biggest price is the financially uneducated and it's the poor. And it is this is where it gets so unfortunate because inflation is a, is a hidden tax. Remember what I said a second ago, the government makes money through tax dollars. And so if they can't generate enough tax dollars to pay for their expenses, they're going to have to make up their cost from somewhere. And so what do they do? Well, right now, they're just printing that money. So if you print that money and you inject it into the economy, it causes the prices of assets to go up, at least in dollar terms, right? Real estate prices go up, stock values go up because there's money just being freely injected into the economy. Well, who does that benefit? It disproportionately benefits the wealthier versus the poor because now if you get free money, and you go shopping on Amazon, you go to the Gucci store, you go to the Apple store, you go to Lululemon and you spend that money, what happens? Apple gets richer, Lululemon gets richer, Amazon gets richer. These are the companies that profit. So now all the dollars, while they went to people, they flow back up to the top. And now these corporations have a bigger share of the dollars because now there's more dollars floating on in the economy. And each dollar that you have is worth less than before because now your, your savings can't stretch as far and your salary doesn't stretch as far. So anytime you create this type of inflation, it disproportionately hurts the people who are not financially educated. It disproportionately hurts the people who are poor. So what does that happen? You create a bigger wealth gap. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, 
And then it essentially wipes out the middle class. This is why our middle class is beginning smaller and smaller and smaller is because if you understand money, then you're going to do something different with your money. If you don't understand money, you're going to be just abused by the system. And this is where financial education is so important because they will never teach you this in school. And it's one of those things that if you don't understand it, you're going to be the one paying the price. And you can hate me for saying this, but it's the reality. And this is where it's just like, please learn the rules. That way you can take care of yourself because if you don't, you're going to be reliant on someone else and they may not have your best interest in mind. I mean, we can, you know, we can hope that the government, corporations, and banks will look out for you. But the reality is you got to look out for yourself. Because yeah. no one's going to care for you the way you do. But isn't, isn't like jobs data essentially positive? Like aren't, aren't people more employed now than they have been in, in, in recent years? Yes, they're, they're more employed today than they were a year ago. However, let's look at the trajectory of things. Unemployment rates now are on an upwards trajectory um, as of today. Uh, and so what does that mean? Corporations are starting to let people go hmm. um, because of what? Well, the economy is starting to slow down. This is a fact because we saw the quarter one economic report and it said that our economy slowed down in the first quarter. Why? Well, inflation. Hmm. Uh, people just don't have the ability to spend like they did before. Our economy r- runs on spending. The way it works is, if I have $1,000 and I go to Amazon and spend that money, well, then Amazon makes $1,000 and then they have more money to invest in new warehouses, hire more people to improve their infrastructure so they can continue to invest that money. But if I keep that $1,000 in my pocket, well, then Amazon doesn't have the ability to grow faster because they're making less money. So in a time where we're facing this very high inflation, what's happening? People have less ability to spend. Because now more of your money is going to pay for your rent. More of your money is going to pay for your food. More of your money is going to pay for your basic life necessities. Gas. Gas. Oh, my God. It's insane. Gas prices are... On my drive here, my buddy texted me. He's not a finance person. He texted me. He says, dude, what's going on? I just paid $7 for gas. He's in Chicago. And he knows I talk about this stuff. And, you know, as soon as the people who are not... Who don't really care about the financial side, start asking questions, that's when you start to realize, oh, it's affecting everybody now. Hmm. And so that's what's happening. It's it's, people are paying so much money for their basic necessities, they don't have money to spend on other things. So if you don't have money to spend on other things, that means companies start making less money. If companies start making less money, what are they going to do? Well, then they have to downsize. Layoffs, yeah. Layoffs. I mean, and and you you know, the, the first place to look is consumer spending. And there's a difference between consumer sentiment and spending. Just look at what's going on with companies because they'll, they'll be completely honest about it. Target, Walmart, Amazon, three of the biggest retailers in America. Each of these three have recently come out and said that inflation is hurting them significantly. They do not have the ability to raise the price of their products enough to cover their higher costs. And on top of that, they're making smaller profits Smaller revenues. Why? People just don't have the ability to spend money on the things that actually make these companies money. Sure, maybe on paper, the revenues look higher because they have to charge more money. Mm. But relative to inflation, it's not keeping up. Wow. And so these companies have, each one of them have reported that they're struggling because of it. And so what does that mean? Well, we're in the situation where either we're going to fight inflation or we're going to fight the recession. And this is where you have to pay attention to what the Federal Reserve Bank is doing. Because the Fed is called the Federal Reserve Bank. However, it's not federal. You can go on their website. It says it plainly on their website that they're not a federal entity. They're not a reserve because they don't keep cash reserves. And they're not a bank. You and I can't go there to bank. So what does that mean? What are they? Well, they're an independent entity that controls the monetary supply. They control the way that money flows. They're a central bank. And so what that means is they can determine what we're going to be doing to fight inflation or fight the economy. If they decide, right now, the plan is that they're fighting inflation. That's why they're raising interest rates and they want to start selling off some of their assets. They have this balance sheet that they built up over the last number of years. The way it works is, I'm going to just take one step back and explain this because it's an interesting concept. Mm. 
the government, United States government, uh, has to have money to spend for whatever they want to do. If they don't have enough money to spend, then they either have to raise their taxes or they're going to have to go out and borrow this money from somewhere. They can go to China, they can go to Japan and borrow this money. But after a certain point, they're going to struggle raising money from other entities. So what do they do? They can issue something called a treasury bond. This is a loan to the United States government. And so they can issue this treasury bond, but if there's not enough private investors, people like you, me, or the people listening to this, if there's not enough private investors to lend money to the government, then they're going to need an alternative source. That's when they call up the Fed and they say, hey, uh, we want to issue, we need a trillion dollars. We're going to issue a trillion dollars worth of bonds. Can you help us out? The Fed, again, doesn't have cash reserves, so they print a trillion dollars and they lend it to the government. So over the course of the last number of years, the Federal Reserve Bank has built up a balance sheet of around $9 trillion. And that means that they've printed $9 trillion and bought up assets like treasury bonds and some other bonds, mortgage-backed securities, in order to help stabilize the economy. That's what they say. And so now we're entering a situation where the Fed is working to fight inflation. Well, if inflation is when you increase the amount of dollars out there, how do you fight inflation? You fight inflation by taking the dollars out. Hmm. So how do you do that? Well, you can raise interest rates because that makes borrowing money more expensive, uh, which makes less money entering in. But raising interest rates, doesn't that usually like send the stock market downward? So yeah, we'll get to that in just okay. a second because see, that's now we're talking about the economy, right? We're fighting inflation because the Fed can do one of two things. They can fight inflation or the economy. So if they're raising interest rates, they're trying to fight inflation. They're trying okay. to bring the dollars out. But that's a good thing. If inflation is sort of like the root cause of all the problems that we're seeing um, in the financial system, then would, is, that, is that theoretically a good thing, raising interest rates? So it depends who you ask. And, I, <laughs> and, and so, you, you know, if you start fighting inflation because start, they start selling off the balance sheet, they start selling off the assets, and they start raising interest rates, what are you doing? You're fighting inflation, but it comes at a price. Hmm. Because now when it becomes more expensive to borrow money, less people are going to buy a home. Less businesses are going to have dollars to invest back into their company. Got it. Because you, you, you brought it up. You said tech companies saw a massive boom. Why? Well, many of these tech companies were not profitable. They were more on the speculative side. And so when you have venture capital investors, these big banks and institutions who can borrow hundreds of millions of dollars at 3 or 4% a year, you don't need a big return to justify an investment. So they were willing to throw money into a lot of these unprofitable companies and say, hey, just go out and grow as big as you can, as fast as you can, and hopefully we'll figure out how to profit later down the line. So now if you're a company and you're like, well, I have pretty much unlimited money, what are you going to do? Well, okay, I'm going to sell you a dollar for 95 cents. You can grow the users very fast because everyone's going to want to join on because you keep giving them free perks and free bonuses where it's like, I would be dumb not to take advantage of the things that you're offering. And so, you know, you saw this massive boom in the tech momentum company industry, and now interest rates are going up, which means if you need now money to continue operating, an investor is going to look at you and say, mm, <laughs> you're not as uh, safe of an investment as somebody else. So I don't think you're really worth $30 billion. I think you're only worth $5 billion. Wow. What does that mean? The stock prices go down. And so a lot of these companies, especially the tech companies, rely on their valuations to continue raising money, whether it's through investors from equity or through debt. That way they can continue funding their operations and growing. And now when you enter a raising interest rate environment, it completely changes because now investors want to look for stability. They want to see profits. They want to see stable growth. And so if you don't have the ability to do that, you're, you're not going to be able to continue raising dollars. Your valuation falls. And either you have to now uh, shut your doors or you're going to have to find a way to become profitable or you're going to have to cut your costs. Carvana just laid off a couple thousand people. Netflix announced layoffs. Uh, there's a, pretty much across the tech sector, you have a hiring freeze going on. And interestingly, so I'm an attorney, right? And one of my uh, good friends, he is a chief legal officer at a bigger parts company. I just talked to him about how things are going. And what he was telling me was on his company's end, not good, that inflation is hurting them really bad. And they just don't have the ability to raise the price of the products as much as their producer costs are going up. So their 
the cost to produce the products is growing significantly faster than the cost that they can raise the price to the consumer. But what was really interesting was he said that there's this there's big shift in the legal field where a lot of law firms have been just hiring M&A mergers and acquisitions attorneys because they're kind of preparing for this shift in the economy where if you're one of those companies, you can't continue your operations. Either you're going to go bankrupt or you're going to get bought out. Mm. So when you're getting bought out, that's a merger or acquisition. So these bigger companies are already kind of anticipating that this might be coming, that there might be more acquisitions and mergers coming. And so the legal field, they're, they're trying to already stack up their, their lawyers to get ready for that. Wow. Well, <laughs> so if, we are, if we're on the cusp of uh, a potential recession, right, um, how does somebody who is um, making a smart decision, right, how does a, how does a financially literate person um, view this current point in time as an opportunity? And if so, what can be done to capitalize on, uh, on, on everything that we're seeing, all the, all the tumult that we're seeing in the, in the markets? So when the majority of people hear that word, the R word, recession, the majority of people get scared, creates anxiety, creates panic, because they you know, think layoffs, market crashes. But for the minority of people, it means opportunity. And this is where you want to be able to find that opportunity. Now, the question is where and how. Well, <clears throat> there's no way to predict what's going to happen tomorrow, whether the market's going to go up or down. But the entity that you want to pay attention to is the Fed, because there's two things that can happen. So I was talking to you about what they're doing right now to fight inflation. If they continue fighting inflation by raising interest rates and selling off the balance sheet, and then we go into a recession, it's not inevitable, right? This is just kind of like the op option. So if we do go into recession, then the Fed could say, all right, um, we're going to pause on inflation, and now we're going to focus on a recession. How do you fight a recession? Well, for the last almost century, the way that we fought a recession is through stimulus. Back to the Great Depression. We stimulated. We, we created, uh, we cut interest rates. We created stimulus to help the economy grow. The 2001 crash, we created quantitative easing. 2008, quantitative easing. We stimulated, cut interest rates, sent out stimulus checks. 2020, cut interest rates, quantitative easing, stimulus checks. It's inflation to help stimulate the economy. Because what happens? Markets go down, businesses start to struggle, you start to inject dollars into the economy, you start to inject inflation, and it helps to turn down the economy. Is that a bad thing? Because <coughs> that's like fueling the inflationary fire, it, isn't it? It creates an inflationary bubble, and it, huh. it's, it's inevitable in the system. And, you know, it, it's, it's not really a matter of bad or good, it is what it is. Got it. And, I mean, it's... it's and the United States isn't the first entity government to do this. This has been happening since the ancient Roman Empire. The ancient Roman Empire, when they wanted to grow, they started debasing the value of their currency. They used to transact mainly in silver, silver coins. And then they wanted to invest in their infrastructure. They wanted to grow their military. So they started debasing their currency, meaning they started mixing silver with cheaper metals. And then they started paying people with that. And then what happened was inflation the workers said, well, now I need more coins in order to go live my life. So it started to create this inflationary spiral and it, along with a lot of other factors, but ultimately led to the collapse of the Roman Empire. So, I mean, it's not the first time that this has happened. This has been happening for centuries now, but this is where, you know, it's not a matter, I mean, people have opinions of what's good and what's bad. What I'm trying to say is not it's good or it's bad. It's This is what's happening. Hmm. Be aware, be educated. That way you can take care of yourself. So, you know, if, if we run into a situation now where the Fed says, you know, we're going to, if we do go into a recession, the Fed says, all right, we're going to stimulate. Well, what's that going to do? Cut interest rates, more quantitative easing. Now you could potentially see a crash in the markets upwards. Typically, when you think of a market crash and realistic crash, you think of a downwards crash, right? Yeah. The prices of things go down. But what's the upwards crash? Well, if, if you just start creating more inflation already when you have super high inflation, the value of your currency drops. People want to get out of cash and they turn to assets, mm. stocks, real estate. It creates, like what I was talking about, a bigger wealth gap. Inflation disproportionately hurts the poor. And so if they do that, then you know 
you might prolong a recession per se, but now you create a more of a currency issue, currency crisis. And that's what you have to pay attention to because if the Fed does the opposite, where they say, all right, we're in a recession, but we're gonna keep fighting inflation, then that means they're gonna continue to push interest rates higher. And like what you said, many times they can push the market slower. It makes the housing market slow down because then it's more expensive to buy a home. So it can completely shift the dynamics, but this is where, again, I don't know what the Fed is gonna do. I don't know if they're gonna change their fight and go towards the recession. I don't know if they're gonna change their fight, go towards inflation. I don't know how bad this might be. I don't know, maybe we'll avoid it. Because, I mean, if you look at the spectrum, let's just be, look, I don't like to tell people this is what's gonna happen or this is what you need to do. What I like to say is, let's be educated. Yeah. There, there's a whole spectrum of, of things that can happen. On one end is, best case scenario, the Fed raises interest rates gradually. They uh, sell off their balance sheet gradually. And this eases inflation, and it also doesn't cause a recession. That's the best case scenario. This is what the Fed and the government is hoping for. This is what they predict. Option number two is uh, the Fed raises interest rates and does a quantitative tightening, and it causes a dip in the economy, but it's short term. We get out of it. This is what most of Wall Street is hoping for, hmm. that we're going to see a dip in the economy. We're going to see a slowdown in the markets, but then we'll pick right back up. And then you have kind of like the more of the, the worst case scenario. Option number three is now we enter a recession and the Fed can do one or two things. If they cut interest rates because they, they change course and say we want to fight the slowing economy, well, then that can cause asset prices to go up and it can prolong the recession, but create even worse inflation. Mm. On the flip side, if the Fed continues to raise interest rates in a recession, then that means that We'll go deeper into a recession. However, we will strengthen the dollar, strengthen the currency. We don't have to worry about any sort of currency crisis. However, we'll face a recession and maybe a longer recession. Then you have the worst case scenario, which would be something like stagflation. And that's what happened in 2008, right? Stagflation, last time we saw it was in the 1970s. Oh. 2008 was a financial crisis. Uh, so, stagflation is a really weird phenomenon where you have rising inflation and a slowdown in the economy, meaning lowering wages. So wages are going down while the cost of living is going up. And that would be the ultimate worst case scenario because now you have layoffs happening, you have a prolonged recession, and then the Fed has to decide, what do we do? Are we gonna fight the depression? Or are we gonna fight inflation? And the same issue as before, if they continue to fight inflation, it would put us deeper into a depression into this stagflation time until we could save and get inflation under control. Or the opposite is the Fed then says, we're going to cut interest rates. We're going to fight the depression, create more inflation. And now you risk a real currency crisis. And that would be the ultimate worst case scenario. Um, and the advantage that we have in the United States is that we are the world's superpower. We have the world's reserve currency. We have the world's strongest military. Um, other countries don't. Just last week, at the time of this recording, uh, Sri Lanka defaulted on their debts, the government. Currency crisis. So what does that mean? The government spent more money than they were bringing in, and they could no longer afford servicing their debts. They declared default, and now you have this widespread inflation. You have just civil unrest. It's just a bunch of issues. So it's like, if that happens, that's the ultimate worst case scenario, because now you have to just deal with everything going wrong in the economy. So that's kind of where... Those know, are the you, four scenario, the potential four scenarios. scenarios, yeah. Best case to worst case, where are we going to be? Um, and this is where, you know, no one can predict. I'm not trying to say it's going to be the worst or it's going to be the best. Understand this, but pay attention to it and then understand now you can look for the opportunity. And this is where, one, you want to stay up to date on what's happening. Um, this is why I started, I built something called Market Briefs. It's a free financial newsletter because you have to stay up to date on what's happening without all the like, you know, there's a lot of sensationalism in the traditional click media. You have to, yeah. And the reason why is because they want to get your click over somebody else. So Market Briefs is a newsletter. It keeps and, them in business. Yeah. So Market Briefs is a newsletter. And the reason why I like this and the why we're kind of investing in this direction is because headlines don't mean anything. You get one email every morning. It's like five minutes and it breaks down the things you need to know about inflation, about the real estate market, the stock market, what's happening in the global economy and anything else. And so, there's, you know, it's just, we explain it. And so that's why... It's like, if you want to be educated about what's going on, that's why I'm working on this. But now the question is, 
how do you invest your money? Yeah, because chaos is a ladder. <laughs> yeah. Chaos is a ladder. And you're out here crushing financial ignorance. So if somebody has, say somebody listening to this has a thousand bucks, right? That they, the discretionary money, it's just laying around. Should they keep it in their banks? Should they be putting it in the markets? What should, what should they do with it? So this is where you got to be honest with yourself because there's a few different ways that you can go. If you are one of those people and you, where you hate the idea of investing your money, you hate the idea of researching companies, you hate the idea of listening to earnings calls, you do not want to get into the game of trying to pick stocks because that's just not what you want to do. So at the end of the day, like what I was saying before, recessions make more millionaires than any other time. Mm. But that means you have to look for the opportunity. Now, how do you find this type of opportunity? Well, the way it works is when you see any sort of market crash, think about like Black Friday for investors. Um, in the 2008 crash, real estate went on sale. I started investing in real estate after the 2008 crash, kind of on accident. And I'm from Michigan, where GM, Ford, and Chrysler are the, the main economy in Michigan. And that's when the auto crisis, the auto market was decimated in 2008. So GM went bankrupt, Chrysler went bankrupt, Ford was on the verge of bankruptcy. And so that really hurt the real estate market in Michigan, particularly because we saw real estate prices drop in some instances by 90 to 92%. Wow. My first investment property was a small condo that I bought for eight grand. It was the total price of the condo. That's the insane. Downside. Yeah. And it, I, I didn't know anything else because I was 19 and that was the first deal that I ever got involved with. To me, it was normal because I didn't know anything else. Now I look back and I see, oh my God, like that was insane what kind of market it was. But during that time, everybody thought that I was the dumb one for wanting to invest in real estate because everybody's, you know, when you start to see these types of downturns, everybody gets very scared. They panic. Part of it has to do with the media because, you know, it's either the world's ending or nothing will ever go wrong. It's kind of, you sell one or two polar extremes. And during that time, everyone thought that it was all done for. The real estate market is done. None of the, the financial markets are done. But that's where you have to have the belief in the right education. In 2020, it was the stock market and the crypto market. The stock market uh, fell at the fastest rate ever. And I was talking about this on YouTube. And I said, look, um, here's what I'm doing. I'm doing something called drip buying. And what I do is I, I've already had a list of companies that I wanted to invest in. And if their price drops, I'm just going to buy. Every 10 to 15% it falls, I buy more. And the lower it goes, the more aggressively I buy. I buy in phases because I can't time the market. And when I made these videos talking about it, I got this flood of comments from people saying, why would you buy now? The market's going to collapse. Everything is going to go so much lower. Is Why would you buy at this point? And I kept saying, look, I can't time the market. I don't know how much lower it's going to go. I don't know how long it's going to last. But what I do know is I can kind of average my way in and I can buy in phases. And what happened? Well, the Fed opened up the money printer and we saw this massive rally. I did not predict that to happen, but all I knew was I was buying in phases. And so you can't look at the market today and say, it's going to be the same as 2020. It's going to be the same as 2008. It's going to be the same as 2001. No, History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So what you want to do is get the education. It rhymes, wow. Yeah, you want to get the education. That way now you can pay attention to what's happening and then look for the new opportunity. So, you know, where is it going to be? I don't know. But if you have $1,000, you know, if you're not willing to invest your money and do the time into individual companies, then invest in phases. Break it up or take, if you can invest $1,000 a month or every thousand or, you know, $100 a month or whatever it is, take it in phases, break it up, and then you can just do a dollar cost average system where now every week you just buy in a little bit of the market. And now... This is where you can pick your risk tolerance. You can just pick like the general S&P 500, the biggest 500 companies in the stock market that we pretty much just getting general exposure to the stock market. Or you can pick specific sectors like tech or whatever you want. So, you know, you really got to pick your risk tolerance. I'm personally, and I'm not a financial expert. That's my disclaimer. So don't sue me. But I like these like ETFs, right? Where you can buy, like I'll just throw one out, like SPY. Yeah. You're basically buying a little piece of like all of the top 500 companies. Yeah, S in the U.S. Yep, SPY gives you exposure to the S&P 500, the biggest 500 companies in the stock market. And it's, it's, it's just your way to invest in the American economy. If you believe in the American economy and you think that in 10 years, 
for 20 years is going to be stronger than where we are today. Then what you can do, you just buy a little bit of it every week. And now if the market goes up, you keep buying. If it goes down, you keep buying. You don't change your strategy. And so it just gives you the opportunity to kind of buy more at a lower price. It's just on sale. So this is where you have to be able to control the psychology, your emotions, and know your strategy. And they can become extremely difficult during downturns because... Everybody wants to pull out. Everybody but that, wants to pull But that's out. where the money is made for the people who, who hold. Exactly. And you have to be willing to now make the right... Because you don't want to buy into bankruptcy. This what was that? There was a great book called 100 Baggers. I'm not familiar have with you that. Read the book? Well, basically, like, you could 100x on... There are some stocks that historically have offered 100x returns, but you have to weather profound dips to get to that 100x. And most people, they just don't have the, they just don't have the, the, the courage to A- weather or the, or, the, or the stomach to weather those dips. Amazon went down more than 90% during the 2000, 2001.com bubble bursting. It takes a lot to see your investment portfolio go down 10%, 30%, 50%, 70%, 90% and keep holding or even potentially buy. So it's not easy, especially when competitors or similar companies in that space are going bankrupt left and right. Yeah. So, you know, it's that's where, you know, if you're going to be investing in individual companies, you have to be willing to put in the work. You, know, you don't want to just keep be buying into bankruptcy, but an ETF lowers some of that risk. And then you could just own a piece of the, and generally the economy, and you just keep buying on the way down. And then as it keeps going, you just keep buying. You're just working to accumulate more shares. And then if you have particular companies you want to buy, you buy them in phases. Buy it on the way down instead of trying to perfectly time the market. You do not want to try to time the market. Instead, just look for the opportunities. I've always, I've always heard. Uh, tell me if this is true. Time in the market trumps timing the market. Yeah, I think Warren. It's a good Buffett way to said think about that. that. Oh, is did he? I, I think Warren Buffett said that, and I think yeah, I agree. I mean, at the end of the day, you just keep your money in there. Don't even think about it. Basically, yeah. I mean, you know, people. All, a lot of people ask, you know, is this the time to sell? If it's going to go lower, should I sell now? And Again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'll give you my advice. I don't sell unless there's a reason. And what is that reason? Even if I have a better place to put my money or if I think that this asset, something's wrong with it, maybe Mm -hmm. the company's going to go bust or something's wrong with the underlying asset, or if I can get a better return somewhere else, I find another opportunity. If I'm not looking at retiring, if I don't need this money in the next five to 10 years and I'm just going to sell because I'm worried about the economy, then I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm just holding. All I'm trying to do is accumulate more and I'll sell if I have a reason to sell. If there's no reason to sell, I'm just going to keep holding and accumulating more. Yeah. And also you should probably have a great deal of uh, understanding about the asset, right? Like um, don't, don't invest in things that you don't understand. Yeah. Uh, and the best example right now is cryptocurrency. <laughs> you know. It, Here's what, look, I, I'll give you my opinion. I, I like crypto. I, I invest in crypto, but I think there's a lot of crap in crypto. And what does that mean? Well, people were hoping that everything could be a get rich quick type of system where if I can throw my money in any of these coins, I'm going to be able to 10x my money essentially overnight. And, I, you know, I've talked about this many times where I'm like, look, I believe in crypto. I think there's a lot of value in the blockchain technology. But you have to believe in it and you have to be willing to withstand the storms because you're going to see a bunch of booms, a bunch of busts. You're going to see crashes. And what happens with that? Well, you're going to see the growth of scams. You're going to see the growth of crappy coins. And once the free money starts to go away, that's when you know the tide goes out and you see who's been swimming naked. Mm. And so you know that's when you're going to start to see some of the coins go bust. And as soon as you see those prices go down, because it's going to hurt the whole sentiment of the market, that's when you're going to see people turn. Right? The people who loved crypto, hope they'll get rich, will hate it. And then you're going to see this massive change. And you have to, again, you got to understand what it is. You got to love it and you got to believe in it. And, you know, and, and of course, it's risky. I, I understand that it's a very speculative investment. And that's why, it's, you know, it's a, it's a part of my speculative part of my portfolio. I invest my money in five places. I invest my money into my own businesses. That's my number one investment. Uh, and startups that I invest in. Number two is real estate. Number three is stocks. Number four is in crypto. And number five is in physical gold. So crypto is my second smallest investment. It's in the speculative side. Um, But I'm not going in and investing in 
a bunch of random coins. I'm investing my money into the coins that I understand, that I believe in, and I'm going to hold on to them for the long term. You invest in startups. Isn't that super high risk? It's very high risk. Now, why do I invest in startups? Well, because I am an entrepreneur. I feel like I never really had a lot of support as an entrepreneur. So it's a way for me to support other entrepreneurs. And I love working with entrepreneurs. I love the whole idea of entrepreneurship. So startup investing, extremely risky, high potential return. Nine out of 10 startups will fail. That's what the numbers say. But for me, I enjoy it. Um, it's something that I like to do and it's become much more accessible for people nowadays thanks to crowdfunding. There's platforms out there that let you do it uh, for a little with as little as like 100 bucks, maybe even $50, depending on the platform. But you got to, again, with anything, you got to understand the risk. And if you're willing to accept that risk, then it could be something for you, but you have to understand the risk. You have to understand the risk. I, I feel very grateful that I get to uh, invest in startups. And I invest in startups that I believe in, that I want to help further. Um, you know, like Element, it's an electrolyte company that I, I use their product. I invest in like a baby food company that like makes the baby food that if I had a baby. Yeah. That's what I would be feeding. Exactly. The baby, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so it's yeah. Purposeful investing. Purposeful investing. Yeah. Investing. Yeah. With a purpose. Okay. What does your daily routine look like to set yourself up for success? Because you're obviously super successful. You've got this huge social media platform. You're smart as hell. Like you've got all this, all this knowledge to drop. I don't know about all that, but I appreciate it. Yeah. But what's it? <laughs> tell me about your daily routine. So, my daily routine right now is a little bit different because I'm in California and I'm based out of Michigan. So I'll kind of give you both. But what I like to do is I start, I like to start my days with some sort of like walk or some sort of like where mindful, calming meditation exercise. I love exercising. When I, I'm not a huge, big, like the meditating, sitting down, but I, for me, walking is meditation. So what I used to do when in Michigan, um, and I don't do it as much here, and I'll explain why. But in Michigan, I go on a, a hour and a half walk in the mornings, about five miles, and I listen to an audiobook. And it is my way of just being alone, and I just think, and I listen to my audiobooks, and it's one of the most peaceful things ever. And I started doing this during the pandemic because the gyms were closed, and I just I just kept up with it because I, I mean it just I I learned so much from my audiobooks, and it just gives me that opportunity to just let my mind go. It's the only time that I have. All finance related or like different topics? Anything. Um, I, I really have been getting into biographies a lot. I've been listening to just tons of biographies from entrepreneurs to investors to just anyone who's done something. Um, it doesn't have to be an entrepreneur, but I, I just like, I like biographies. Hmm. Um, after that, I'll get ready. I'll go to work, uh, to the office. And then uh, I'm there. Depends, but you know, I could be there anywhere from six hours to 12 hours, depending on the day. Um, and I try to go to the gym in the evening. And after the gym, then I come home and uh, I I might do a little bit more work later, depending on what, what is going on. But I'll try to do less work then and then uh, spend just some time with the family. How much time on a, in a given day do you dedicate to looking at, tracking, analyzing the markets? Oh, man. So I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, I don't know how much time I dedicate every day, but it's a big chunk of my day. Hmm. And that was actually the reason why I started Market Briefs because I, I make these YouTube videos on minority mindset. And I talk about money management, investing, and these are all things that I wish somebody would have told me when I was growing up. So it was just, I started it as a hobby and now it's grown into something so much bigger. But you know, as things started crazy and started happening in the markets, I started talking more about current events type of stuff just because people wanted that. And it became very overwhelming for me to keep up with every single news source. So I, I had some people on the team. I said, look, start putting together like a daily email for me. Like what's happening in the markets? That way I can get like a summary and I know what to look at. So started doing that. And I was like, this is kind of cool. I wonder what would happen if I just started like telling the audience about this hmm. and uh, kind of did like this a little promotion. Like, hey, we have this newsletter for under minority mindset. That's what it was under the time. And people really enjoyed it. And after a while, I was like, this is like, we could actually turn this into like a business. Like people like our newsletter. We're, you know, spending more time into it. Let's, let's try to turn this into something. So that's when we turned this newsletter under the Minority Mindset name into Market Briefs, into its own financial newsletter. So, I mean, I start with that, but then I spend, I mean, I spend a lot of time um, 
just kind of going deeper into what's going on because I enjoy it. Um, and then it provides me analysis, not only for what I do, but then also with the things that I talk about. So if it's not me and there's people on my team, this, I mean, this is what we do, right? We, so we, we, I spend a lot of time on that. Yeah. It's like financial markets, also real estate. Is that Finan- real estate, stocks, crypto, what's happening in the global economy, um, inflation, ec- just general economic stuff. So yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of different sectors in that sense. Tell me about real estate. Is now a good time to, to buy a house or? So I'll give you my opinions on buying a home because I don't look at a home the way most people do. I look at a home like buying a t-shirt or a shirt. I will, I will buy a shirt if I can afford it and if I like it. If I'm going to buy a home to live in, I'm buying it for the memories. I'm not buying it for, oh, what can this home be worth in five years or 10 years? I think that's the wrong way to look at a home because I used to be a real estate salesperson. When I started investing in real estate when I was 19, I was like, I don't want to keep working with an agent. I want to do it myself. So when I was 20, I got my real estate sales person's license and I started helping people buy and sell homes. And the whole pitch is you're helping somebody buy the biggest investment of your life. And I don't like to look at the home that I live in as an investment because when you look at it as an investment, it's easier to get you to spend more, buy bigger because it's an investment. It's an investment for your kids. It's an investment in your future. So buy the biggest and best home that you can. And and it works because then also... You get the bigger home, the real estate agent gets a bigger commission check, the banker gets a bigger commission check because now they're going to give you a bigger mortgage. Again, not every one of these people is bad, but I mean, it's, it is is what it is. So if you're going to be buying a home, th- the key factor is not what's happening in the market. It should be, can I afford the home? Affording means, can I afford the down payment? Can I afford the monthly payment? Can I afford the moving costs? And can I afford the new move-in costs? Because when you move in, you want to upgrade their bathrooms, you want to upgrade the kitchen, you want to get the new furniture. If you can afford it, forget what's going on in the economy, go out and buy a dream home. But if you can't afford it, don't go out and buy it. So, I mean, at the end of the day, that's why I don't consider your home an asset. Because for the majority of people, your home is a money pit. And then you hope that you can sell it for profit. But home prices don't always go up. We Hmm. saw that happen in 2008. And I don't know where home prices are going to be in five years. Maybe they'll be higher. Maybe they'll be lower. I don't try to predict that. Even when I invest in real estate, I don't care what's happening in the market. When I invest in real estate, I'm looking for one thing, cash flow. I want to see what amount do I have to pay today? How much cash is this going to generate every year from here on out? So if home prices go down, it doesn't matter. I'm still getting my cash flow. If home prices go up, great. It's icing on the cake. So I don't really care what's happening in those day-to-day swings. And you know, going back to the home buying question, I don't look at it like an asset. How do you get cash flow from a house? Like assuming you're renting it out to somebody? Exactly. So Uh you're buying a house as an investment. Now you're buying it to make money. You're not buying it for the purpose of living in. So in Michigan, you can go out and buy a home for 150 grand today. You can rent it out for $1,500 a month. Hmm. And uh, so, you know, it's just a matter of now, how can you find properties that will generate you solid cash flows cover your taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management, and any other fees that arise, your mortgage, and then put some money in your pocket. So now you're, uh, you have the asset that's paying for by itself, paid for by itself, and then it's also putting some money in your pocket. Love that. Yeah. Passive income. That's, a, that's like a big, important, awesome thing to have. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting topic because... I would agree that real estate income, real estate cash flow can be passive, but it it takes a lot of work for it to become passive. And I'll tell you from personal experience, because- Like if you're going to be a landlord, I mean, that no shade against landlords, but like that doesn't sound like it's a job for everybody. So when I first started investing in real estate, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any real estate investor family members. I didn't know any real estate investors. So I I just kind of did it. And what happened was, I'd read these books that said it's it's passive. You need a property management company. The problem was I had a very bad property management company. So I had its tenant in a, in this property and I would get calls almost every day. Uh, one day they were like, oh, uh, we were cutting cucumbers on the countertop, but we missed the cucumber. We scratched the countertop. You need to give us a new countertop. Damn. I was like, oh, I, I don't know what to do in that situation. I got him a new countertop. In one situation, they were freaking out because they said that the property is about to be burned down. Something's wrong with the electrical system. Uh, it's, it's just a, some crazy stuff going on. We sent out an electrician, a bulb went out, it fused, <laughs> right? I mean, it was just, it was a nightmare tenant. 
uh, they, I mean, anything that could have gone, like I, I wanted, I hated the idea of being a slumlord. Like it just never was attracted to me. I wanted to be a person that provided a nice unit, above value unit where you're getting a bargain for your price. So what did I do? I found, you know, okay, this area has certain type of appliances. I'm going to put in stainless steel appliances, something better. So I always wanted to, you know, make sure that if my tenants come here, they like it. That way they want to stay for longer. So it's just like customer retention, but I didn't know what I was doing. And so it was anything but passive in the beginning. So then I started working and I started developing my team, started to meet more real estate agents, more contractors, more uh, property managers, people who were actually good. And now it is essentially completely passive for me. I just look at the reports that I get every month. I don't know who the tenants are. I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day decisions. I have a team that does that. So yes, now it's much more passive. Back <laughs> then to get started, it was anything but passive. Oh man, I once illegally Airbnb'd uh, a place that I was renting. <laughs> but it was great. It, it helped me make ends meet back mm -hmm. at a time when I wasn't really making that much money. Um, but every time I would get a text or a call from the person who was like airbnb my yeah. place with an issue, huh. it sent my life. It was like, it, it instantly activated my fight or flight and it sent my blood pressure through the roof. Yeah. It was just so stressful that I was just like, this is not for me. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's difficult and you have to be willing to put in that work. And that's why, you know, one of the things that I don't like doing is saying you have to do this with your money. You have to invest in real estate or you have to invest in stocks or you have to invest in ETFs. There are so many, you know, like Warren Buffett became rich by investing in individual uh, companies. You have other people that came extremely wealthy by investing in real estate. There, there's no one way to do things. I don't like to say, this is how you have to do it. This is what's going on. Like, right. my, my whole thing is learn, pick what's right for you. You got to try things. You don't know what's going to work for you or what's not going to work for you. And as you learn, you'll become smarter and you're going to say, either I hate this or I love this. What's like an easy, what are, what are some like other uh, means of developing passive income? Well, if it's not real estate, then the next one will probably be investing your money in dividend paying companies. That's cool. So on the stock market, um, when you invest in a company, you're essentially getting your share of ownership and you get your share of profits. Now, if a company is larger and they have a lot of cash at the end of the year, big profits, they can do three things with the cash. They can take this cash and invest it back into the company, open more stores, hire more people, invest in more innovation. They can save this money for emergencies in case we run into another pandemic, or they can give this cash away to investors, mm. shareholders. So if you invest in a company, you own shares of a company, and they have this big cash portfolio at the end of the year, one of the things they can do is just give it away in the forms of a dividend. And this is public information. You can just go onto any stock brokerage website, stock market website, and it will show you if a company is paying a dividend or not. And so what does that mean? If you invest in a company, like just for an example, McDonald's right now, they pay out a dividend. If you own one share of McDonald's, every quarter, meaning every three months, they will send you a check for doing nothing except owning that investment. It's your profit share. You don't got to flip any burgers. You don't got to run a restaurant, but you get a little bit of money for owning a piece of the company. So it's, a, it's another kind of a, it's a simpler way to get passive income without really having to do any of the work. Your work in this sense is mainly just to make sure your company's not about to go bankrupt. Yeah, I love it. I ha I definitely will look to see if companies, if I, before I invest um, in, the, in the market to see if they if they are dividend paying stocks. Um, Apple, you know, pays a dividend, which is dope. Uh, my grandma was a big stock investor and she believed in, she was a big like AT&T. Oh and yeah. AT &T. yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a different time. Um, you know, but AT and T is still like one of these like legacy companies that pays a pretty high percentage wise, right? Um, dividend. That's cool. That's good advice. Yeah, and if it's not that, I mean, then the next way to go would would require now a lot more work because then it's uh, more of you can invest in businesses. I think everybody here needs to own a business. Hmm. However, the majority of people should not be in the business of operating a business. And the majority of people should not be in the business of starting a company. So what does that mean? Well, now you can own a business without actually running it, without actually operating it. And one way to do this with the stock market, where you can invest in startups, where you can invest in companies that you know of that need capital. And now what does that give you? Your piece of the profit. So if a company is making a million dollars a year and you own 10% of that, well, then you can get your share of that money, right? And it's just another way of you to kind of what we we're talking about before. You're not just working to climb the corporate ladder, but you're also owning the corporate ladder because that's where the real wealth is built. It's built through equity 
not just through your salary. Wow. I love that. God, there's so many questions I want to ask you. Leasing a car versus owning one. What's, better, <laughs> what, what's smarter? You got to ask your accountant for that one because now the if you're just talking about financially, just pure financially, if you buy uh, buying a car means no car payments and now you can buy something you can afford. What happens when you lease a car is now you got to, you're, 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 you're is, think of leasing like flying first class. You're, you're going to get the same, get to the same place. However, you get a different luxury with leasing a car because now when you lease a car, you get a new car every two to three years. When you own a car, you know, unless you're flipping or doing all that, you're probably not. So what are you doing? Well, when you own a car, it's a, it, you, you pay it off or you, you, I'm talking about owning it outright, not no car payments. When you own it now, you don't got to worry about the, any payments. You own the car and it's your asset. So it's a different game. And there are certain tax benefits you can get through leasing if you own a business. So that's right. Know, so, you know, that goes more to the, what is, what's better for you. But in general, Hey, you want the best financial thing. Hey, owning the car is the best thing to do. Buy something you can afford with cash and don't finance it. The first time I made a million dollars in a year, I was driving a car with 500 bucks. Damn. Because you know, it's a, it's a liability, right? Your value of your car is going down. And for me, my money was going back into me, my business, my investments. And I don't want to keep, I don't want to go. I, I'm not a materialistic person. Um, I like comfort. I like, you know, certain things like I like traveling. Um, I like traveling comfortably. I don't like sitting in a crammed space if I don't have to, but you know, I, I don't really care about name brand stuff. I'm, I'm, that's just not me. Uh, so I, I enjoy investing. I enjoy entrepreneurship because it's something that I like. I like what I'm doing. I like the purpose that we have, but I think that's the difference between the, you know, you got to know what's important to you, but if you're speaking just financially, own your car, don't have a car payment on your car, take that car payment that you would have had mm. and invest it. Because now the car payment, what are you doing? You're financing a car, which is a liability, is dropping in value and you're paying interest on it. So you're paying interest to drive something that's losing value. Mm. It's a double punch. But a lease, I was under the assumption that you pay the, what it's depreciating. You don't pay the value of the car, you pay what, it, the, what it's losing in, in, in its value. The car company has to make money. And right. so if, if, if they were selling you a lease and not making any money, then the car company is not going to make any money. Leases are very profitable for car companies mm. because then now not only are they making money from the lease, but then you give it back to the car company. Not only that, but you probably have to pay some fees in order to give it back to the car company yeah. if you don't lease another one. And then they're going to go and sell that car again. So, you know, there's benefits to a lease. There's a different value you get from a lease, but you have to make sure you can afford it. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if you're trying to, if you're struggling with your money, then you don't want to be trying to figure out how you can lease the best car possible. Just buy something cheap, something that works, something that's in good working condition, invest the difference. And then once you build your wealth, then you can talk to your tax advisor, your tax accountant to see, does it make sense? Can you get a benefit for leasing your car? I like that. I was leasing my car and my lease expired fairly recently. Um... But because of the shortage, like the chip shortage or whatever, the fact that car values are now like yeah. higher than they were, like my residual value was predetermined three years ago. Yeah. Right. And I had very low miles on my car. So I, th I realized that the best financial decision was then to buy my car outright. Yeah. And I probably made a couple grand it, on it. You know, this is a, <laughs> an exceptional, crazy time where cars became assets. And, you know, this, this, that was a... Uh, a strange time, and I would say it's an outlier, not an exception. Yeah, totally. Or as an outlier, it's not the rule. It's, it's not an the, exception to the rule. It's not the rule. Damn, man. Well, this was fascinating. I feel like, uh, I mean, we could we could go on for hours. Um, would love to have you back for like a, a round two, but um, let's do it. But this is so cool because financial literacy, you know, as I said at the outset, this is something that like so few of us have, and. Um, and uh, yeah, I was like thinking like back to my college experience, like I, I, there, I didn't take a class on, on how to amass wealth, <laughs> you know, if only they had that, right? If only they had that. Yeah. But it's so important. Like who's going to teach it? Who's going to teach it? Well, like, you are, well, huh? <laughs> but just not for the university system because you're reaching more people it, with, uh, with, you know, your, your entrepreneurship. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a tough problem where uh, who Teaching money should happen, but who's going to teach it? And the unfortunate reality, I mean, I don't know, unfortunate, but if more teachers understood money, maybe some of the teachers wouldn't be teaching. 
Mm. Now, there are some great teachers out there, just like anything else. You have some good ones and you have some bad ones. And if the teachers were a millionaire, how many of them would continue teaching? Some of them would, some of them wouldn't. Some of them do it because they love it. Some of them don't. So this is, you know, this is where you have to look out for your own best interest. You have to go out and do it yourself. And unfortunately, no one tells you to do that, but you have to be willing to do that yourself. And I did put together just like, uh, because this was so important to me because, you know, I never learned this. Uh, I spent a long time and I, put, I got together a team of teachers and we created this K through 12 curriculum on money and wow. financial education from budgeting to saving to the basics of kind of how money works. Uh, and I gave away for free. There's no like, mon like I spent, I don't know, tens, a few thousand, I don't, I don't know how many few, but tens of thousands of dollars a few. So like 10 to 30 or 40 grand. I don't know how much I spent on it, but haven't made a penny on it. It's just something I gave away for free on my website on uh, the minority mindset.com. We've had, I forget how many, but thousands of teachers, principals, parents, superintendents download it. It's just a resource just to help because, you know, it's one of those things where we, we live in a world where money rules and you can hate it. You can kick, scream, cry, but it is what it is. And there, the difference between somebody who will become successful and who doesn't become successful is how well you understand it. Now, the good news is D YouTube is decentralizing this education where anybody can learn, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, no matter what your background is, no matter what your parents did, it doesn't matter. Anybody can learn, but you have to be willing to learn and you have to get that education. And no one's, most people are not going to get it handed to them. So you're going to have to go out of your way to get it. And so this is kind of my way of like helping for my personal like mission, my personal morals to like help. People like this, if you can learn this when you're in high school or middle school, then maybe that will make you a little bit more interested. Maybe this will make you a little bit more curious. Maybe this will make you a little bit more like, I got to go figure something out. And so that's what I'm hoping for because, uh, you know, I, it's just one of those things that I never had that. And it's very important. And people need it now more than ever, especially as we're going through, you know, these sorts of economic shifts, this volatility in the markets. Like, you have to be willing to take care of yourself. And, you know, my 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 grandparents uh, were refugees. So, you know, I talked to my grandfather not too long ago, and he was telling me that one of the, the worst diseases is poorness. And the reason why he said that is because he's seen extreme poorness, where when they, in 1947, when uh, my home state of Punjab was severed, they lost everything. Our, so Punjab was severed by the government. And if you were on the west side and you were sick, the person of my religion, uh, you had to migrate east or you were going to be killed. And so my grandparents were on the west side and they had to run east. And this wasn't like a an AC conditioned trip. No, you had to run. And all you had on you was the clothes on your back and a sword in your hand. Wow. And uh, along the way, they got attacked. They got uh, attacked by a mob and uh, they had to fight. My grandfather saw his uncle get his head chopped open right in front of them, tied Jesus. him on a horse, and he was gone. Now, he came to the new India, didn't even have shoes on his feet, had no place to live, had nothing, and had to start from literally nothing. And so, you know, he tells me that, you know, he's like, I've seen extreme poorness. When you are at that level, when you are there, you not only can you not help other people, you can't help yourself. You can't take care of your family. You can't, you can't. You can't feed yourself. How can you even think about feeding somebody else? And so it's one of those things where, you know, if, if you're never taught it, how are you going to learn it? Unless you go out by yourself. And, and most of the time, you're not going to realize that it's even available unless something happens. So that's one of the reasons why I created that curriculum to help hopefully spread that awareness and spread the knowledge. Because, you know, like we all are passionate about something. There's something within each one of us that creates this driving force. And that's where each one of us need to go out. And, you know, if you can become more financially stable, you can serve your purpose much better. And, you know, we all have a purpose. We all have a mission. And that's how we can make the world much better. Someone's going to care about financial education. Someone's going to care about health. Someone's going to care about climate change. Someone's going to care about uh, world hunger. And there's going to be a different reason for each that. And, we ha and you, you know, if you have money, it can help you serve your purpose better. 
Oh man, so true. Is it is it uh, accurate to say that if your money is is just sitting in your bank, you're losing money? <laughs> yeah, you are losing value to inflation every single day. Right now, your bank's paying you what next to nothing, half a percent if you're lucky. Yeah, if inflation is eight percent a year, that means you're losing seven and a half percent on your money every single year. Wow. And it's funny because my first. So it's video, not a safe place to keep your money. Well, I mean, you're like FDIC insured. FDIC insured. In that is, sense, it's maybe safe. But you're guaranteed to lose value every day. And so That's you, know, nuts. You, want, you want to save strategically. That's the most important thing. Uh, because like in the Indian culture, saving, we're a save heavy culture. And so growing up, I was, I was told that, hey, you want to become successful, become a doctor, then save as much money as possible. But what happens? You save your money in the bank and the cash loses value every single day. So you want to see, if you're going to be saving your money, you got to save strategically. Because when you're saving just to save, you're becoming poorer each and every day. Now, if you're saving because you have an emergency fund, just in case something goes wrong, well, now the savings isn't there to make you wealthy. It's there as a shield. It's there to protect you against an emergency. If you're saving to invest in something, now again, you're not saving to just save it. You're saving because you're looking for the right opportunity. You're just waiting for the right time. So if you're going to be saving your money, you need to have a purpose. You have to be more intentional with your money. You want to save purposefully. You want to save intentionally. That way you're doing it for a reason and you have to know why it is that you're doing that. Wow. Would you say that savings accounts are a scam? No, they're not a scam. It's a place for you to put your money. It's like 0.5%. Look, uh, it, it, <laughs> banks are in the business of making money. <laughs> and they make money off of people being financially uneducated and being financially poor okay it is that you have to understand how the banking system works and yeah. you have to use the system to your advantage and you know a savings account isn't a scam it's a place for you to save your money it's not a place to build wealth if you're looking at it as a place to build wealth you need to go and start learning a little bit more about money because it's a place for you to save your money that's it your savings are not there to make you wealthy but but you're not correct me if i'm wrong you're not it's not being saved if it's in a savings account because of inflation. Well, it's, it's not being saved technically. It's not safe. You're, you're losing money. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's losing value to inflation 100%. But if, if you have $100,000 and you put that money in the market, now there's a risk that the market can go down. Right. Um, yes, there's a guaranteed chance that the $100,000 $100, is going to lose value. Uh, so if you want to actually save money, what do you do? Well, then if you don't want to save it in the bank, then the next alternative could be maybe you buy some physical gold. Mm. Gold is a store of value. And so, you know, it takes time, effort, and labor to mine gold. However, gold prices aren't stable either. You see ups and downs. So, you know, there's a purpose for saving. Right. There's a purpose for investing. There's a like purpose you're not for gonna, You're never going to lose your $100,000 if it's in the, sitting in your savings account. Hopefully not. It's, it's just potentially going to lose, lose value. You know, there's a lot of issues with the banking system. What does FDIC insured really mean? I mean, you're backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Sounds great. But until you dig a little bit deeper to what that means, because the United States government doesn't have a stockpile of cash sitting around somewhere. They're backed by taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So if the FDIC, if your bank is backed by FDIC is backed by the government, which means it's backed by you. You are the person that is supporting your savings in the bank account. So what does that mean? If a bank takes your cash and then they go under, that means the government will come in and give out up to 250 grand for each account in that bank. Again, the government doesn't have this cash. Who are they going to go? Taxpayers, well, either they're going to raise their taxes by charging them more money, or they're going to raise their taxes through this invisible tax called inflation, right? The hidden tax. And so you end up paying the price for that. So, <laughs> you know, in that sense, yeah, you, you're the one that's paying for the risk. And the bank can, you know, it goes back to moral hazard. This became a very popular term after the 2008 crash because big banks were making risky loans and they were on the verge of bankruptcy. But the government didn't want to see these banks fail. They were too big to fail and it would create an even bigger financial crisis. So what did they do? They bailed them out. Mm. Again, where did this money come from? It came from the Fed. Where does their money come from? Well, 
is an invisible tax, the hmm. hidden tax, inflation. So who bailed out the banks? It wasn't the government, it was people. It was the regular American people. So that's what you have to understand. I mean, you got to understand the system. You know, it, again, it's you can get angry, you can get upset, but you got to understand the way it works. That way you can use it to your advantage. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. A person that has a lot of neat in their life versus someone that has you know, less can burn upwards of, of 2,000 more calories than the person that's just sedentary still. Wow. Guy.